So good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, first set of presentations. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, having three great presentations that are looking at um, the consumption side of things. So I'm uh, Brian Cook, Senior Researcher on the LEAP Project here at Oxford. Um, so the three presentations this morning are, are going to um, look at the consumption side from actually three quite unique areas. So Rachel Petchy is going to talk about choice architecture and the effect of shifting the availability of meat and meat-free products. Um, Christian Reynolds is going to look at the kind of the information aspect and, and how to score greenhouse gas emissions, which is you know, to inform uh, carbon labeling and environmental impact labeling and so on. And then Emma Garnett is going to look at from the pricing perspective and what happens when we adjust the price of meat and meat-free products. So as always, uh, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A box on the screen here uh, at any point. So each presenter is going to speak for around seven to 10 minutes, and then we'll have some time for some questions after that. So first up, we have um, Dr. Rachel Pecci, so senior researcher here at Oxford, uh, works with us in, on the LEAP project, and she's going to speak to us about some uh, analysis she's done looking at the relative availability of meat-free products. Go ahead, Rachel. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm basically going to be giving a whistle-stop tour today of some analyses we've done of two natural field experiments and one experimental online study, all looking at the impact of increasing the availability of meat-free options on food selection. Um, yeah, excellent, we can move. Uh, okay, um, so first of all, just kind of what is availability? Um, so what I'm really focusing on today is uh, changing the availability in places like shops, restaurants, bars, so I think you kind of adding or removing kind of to the number or the proportion of a particular food item. And um, so kind of following the tip me definition there from Holland to Dal. Um, and we've also, there's also been some previous work talking about different ways you can impact availability. You can change the absolute number of the healthier options available or the meat free options available. You can change the proportion or you could change both. And today, because I'm going to be focusing on kind of works like cafeterias in particular, that kind of environment, there's not any, uh, not enough space to change the number available. So it's kind of changing the proportion. So when we're talking about available today, it's increasing the proportion of meat-free uh, food options available. Um, so just to give a bit of a background about previous research, looking at the availability of uh, food. Uh, there was a Cochrane review by Holland Adal a couple of years ago. Um, and they found six availability studies at that point, um, all of which suggested uh, kind of the suggestion of uh, aggregating these was that lower availability of uh, food products could reduce the selection or consumption of these foods. But there was low certainty in the evidence. And at that point, there was uh, no uh, research that was pertaining to kind of more or less sustainable foods or uh, foods that had meat or didn't have meat in them. But since then, um, Emma, who's going to be talking to you later, <laughs> has done a study looking at increasing the proportion of vegetarian meals in the university cafeteria. And uh, she found that if you increase the proportion of vegetarian meals available, that does increase the selection and consumption. So by changing it from I think 25 percent to 50 percent uh, of vegetarian meals available, there was an eight percentage point increase uh, in the university cafeteria. Um, so we wanted to kind of build a bit further on this uh, evidence base. So I'm going to be reporting first about a natural experiment we did in one university cafeteria. So for one term in this university cafeteria, they changed the availability of meal options from having one meat free and two meat options to two meat free and one meat option. And 11 other cafeterias catering to the university didn't change the availability of their meat free options. So they're are kind of semi-controls in this instance. Um, we did an interrupted time series analysis at looking at the percentage of hot meals containing meat that was purchased from the cafeteria um, before and after this change to the availability of meat-free meals. Um, so here are our results. So we've got on the y-axis here, the percentage of meals sold that contained meat. So we can see that prior to the intervention, which is our dotted line, um, coming in near the end of the graph there to the right-hand side, about 60% of the meals uh, bought in the cafeteria contain meat. But when they uh, the increase the availability of meat-free ma meals, this dropped to around 40% of meals bought containing meat. So a 20 percentage point decrease 
so quite a big uh, change there. Um, although you know, still not as much. So we, uh, that meat options are still preferred relative to their availability, but uh, still quite a significant change. And importantly, none of the other cafeterias um, showed a drop in uh, meals containing meat being sold in the same time period, suggesting that this was potentially a result of the availability. Um, what, uh, so then uh, we did a second study. So one of the issues we have with the first study, obviously, is it is a university cafeteria. So we're not going to argue that's a very representative population. So we're interested in trying to expand this out a bit further. Um, so we have contact with a nationwide catering provider. Um, and we were aware that they had introduced meat-free Mondays and tried to increase the number of meat-free options on their base menu. So we're interested in trying to evaluate what effect this then had on sales uh, across their customer base. But just to note that as well as having this base menu um, that the, the catering provider puts out to each of the sites, the chefs at the individual sites can select which options to put on their individual site menus. So although the base menu has increased in meat-free options, it's uh, the, the actual increase in availability might vary by site. So it's not possible to um, say that that will translate across into the availability at the sites. So we did an interrupted time series analysis of 18 sites. I should say this was happening during the COVID-19 pandemic. So there was a limited number of sites available. So we chose kind of larger sites and tried to limit the vari variability there. Uh, and again, the outcome was the percentage of hot meals containing meat that they purchased um, before and after. Um, so here are our results for study two. So um, this has been a little bit truncated, so sorry. Um, the, on the left here, we have uh, the ITS looking at the percentage of meals purchased that were vegetarian. So we can see that, um, again, and again, the intervention is the dotted line there around week 15 was when the, well, not the intervention, that the, the change to availability um, the natural experiment we're evaluating. So beforehand, around 10% of um, meals purchased were vegetarian. And then when they introduced this new menu, uh, this crop, the, the around 12, 13% of meals purchased were vegetarian. So about a two percentage point increase, so quite a small increase. Um, but then if we look at the chart on the right, this actually shows what the change in availability was. So this is the percentage of meals offered that were vegetarian. So we can see that this went from around 22% to about 25%. So a 3% increase in the meals offered. So actually it was quite a small change that we actually saw in the availability of vegetarian options. Um, but we did see a, a small increase in purchasing as well in these um, actual <laughs> works like cafeterias, catering to a, um, and it mainly manufacturing and distribution. So. Okay, um, so just to quickly move on to study three, really it's a whistle stop tour. Um, so this was going now to an online experiment. So what we want to interested in here is trying to explore a bit more whether or not the impact of availability might vary by demographic characteristics. So whether or not the small changes we saw, for example, in study two, were just due to the small change in availability or whether actually these are harder to implement or people might be less responsive in these kinds of environments. So we recruited a sample of over 2000 adults, kind of represented the UK in terms of their age, gender and distribution by highest educational qualification. And we randomized them to select um, a meal that they'd like to eat right now um, from either one meat free and three meat options two meat free, two meat options, or three meat three and one meat option. So that kind of looks a bit like the display in the middle there. They just kind of got a question and a picture of a meal which was taken from a, a manual for works like cafeterias. So trying to match it to the kind of thing you might be seeing in these environments and varying the meat to meat free ratio. Um, so here are our main results. So we found, again, quite a strong effect of availability. So reducing meat-free options from 50% to 25%, more than half the odds of selecting a meat-free option, whereas increasing the meat-free option from 50% to 75%, more than doubled the odds of selecting a meat-free option. So again, we're finding this effect of availability. Um, but one of the other questions was whether or not this had any differential effect 
by demographic characteristics. So sorry, I don't expect anyone to actually be able to take in much of the graphs here, but just to show you kind of the, the, the parallel lines that there wasn't any evidence of interactions between meat-free availability by gender education and usual meat consumption. So there was a kind of small effect where um, if you were female, you were more likely to choose meat-free, uh, higher education were more likely to choose meat-free, and if you ate less meat, usually you were more likely to choose meat-free, but um, these didn't actually uh, have any interactive effects. So wasn't differential responding um, to the availability, increased availability, depending on these characteristics. Um, so quickly to get to the conclusions now. Um, so kind of the evidence continues to suggest that changing the availability of meat-free options can be effective at reducing uh, selection of uh, dishes that contain meat. Uh, and that, you know, larger changes to availability lead to greater changes in purchasing and selection, as we might expect. Uh, study three interestingly suggested that there was no evidence of a difference in effectiveness by the different demographic characteristics. So it might be a promising intervention to change behavior across the population. Uh, however, at the minute, we still don't have any kind of evidence uh, from field studies where we've uh, been able to randomize sites or kind of done a, um, a more controlled intervention. So for us, that would be the next step to try and put that in place. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Rachel. Very interesting to see that uh, this strategy seems to be promising uh, in several studies that you and others have done. So um, again, if anyone has any questions, um, Christian actually has one here asking whether did you shift the order of the display in the survey that you mentioned at the end there? Yeah, so uh, as well as kind of getting randomized to the ratio of, that they, uh, of meat to meat free options, that uh, all the which options kind of fell into each group was randomized. It wasn't the same options each time and whether where they got displayed within the thing, whether it was left or right or middle was also randomized. So, yeah. And I think we've got a question from Tammy Tong. Let me see if I can actually allow her. Tammy, does that work? You might be muted, Tammy. All right. She may Do you want to type it in the chat if you, yes. something else is going wrong? So while she's doing that, Rach, I had another one about, um, so we know that availability can, can be quite effective according to some of the work that you've done. When you look at it from the lens of acceptability, both to the consumer and to the canteen staff and so on, and also the feasibility of implementing this kind of strategy, do you have any sense compared to other kind of strategies we've looked at how they stack up around acceptability and feasibility? Yeah, so we've done some work on acceptability of different kinds of interventions and availability. Um, oh, it's okay, Danny. Um, availability um, was kind of middling, I guess. So in general, people seem to be more in favor of things like media campaigns or labeling that are a little less intrusive um, and um, really against the idea of things like price um, and, and taxes. But availability, I guess, kind of comes in the middle. It, it changes your the availability of options, as you would expect, it's in the title, um, but um, you've still got that choice of whether or not you pick up on uh, the different items. So I think it falls in the middle there. In terms of feasibility, like we didn't come into any particular problems when we've done uh, field studies trying to change availability before, um, but it does require a bit more uh, planning in advance to implement such trials than, for example, rolling out labeling and things like that. Mm. Um, and here one for Bill Jeffrey. Uh, what about using language in the choice to force consumers to attend to the fact that red meat is part of the choice? Chili con carne, for example, is implied red meat. So the yeah, idea that's an interesting language. point. Yeah, we didn't really kind of we, we kind of use the standard uh, meal descriptions in there. Often that does kind of have, you know, beef and onion pie or, or kind of things like that, where the meat is is really part of the, the name. Um, I guess carne is, <laughs> but chili con carne, but you have to know that. Um, but yeah, that'd be interesting one to try and explore a bit more. And one from 
Emma Harvey Lawrence here. Did you measure whether there was the same or similar number of people using the worksite cafeterias in the second study? In the second study, um, it was quite hard to tell because I say it was in the COVID pandemic. So I think there was a steadily increasing number of people using the cafeteria in the background. So uh, it was quite hard to kind of tease that apart, but I think that'd be interesting to explore in further studies, definitely. Okay, great. Thank you, Rachel. And now we're move on to our uh, second talk. So we have uh, Dr. Christian Reynolds, Senior Lecturer at the Center for Food Policy, City University. And Christian is gonna to talk to us about calculating greenhouse gas impacts and carbon labels for generic meals. Christian, go ahead. Thank you very much, Brian. And it was great to go after Rachel just then. That's an amazing um, piece of work there. And I really wanna talk, if I wish there was a coffee break that we could all just sit down and talk about these things rather than it being Zoom. So hello, my name is Dr. Christian Reynolds. I'm from the Center for Food Policy. And today I'll be talking about calculating the impacts of uh, recipes or what I'm calling now generic meals. Um, so this is something that doesn't just uh, stand alone. Um, this is a discussion that is ongoing in research that's ongoing on many fronts. And the reason I'm approaching this today is as uh, was discussed in the keynote, we need tools and, and standardized data. And one of the biggest things that we have in terms of public engagement is the need for actual examples with quantification behind them of how people can cook sustainably at home. What are the impacts of specific recipes? So there's a photo there of um, last Saturday at the super um, Science Saturday um, in Oxford and lots of people were, oh how do I do this in my real life and the thing is people don't really think in terms of just ingredients such as beef versus lamb versus beans they think in recipes when they're thinking about implementation likewise there's an industry need for sustainable recipe tool and data in terms of menu development and actually recipe developers chefs etc needing these numbers in a method and a format that they can use um, finally there's a policy need in terms of needing data and visualizations, food educators, looking at portion pack advice, all of these different sorts of things. And we started to think of that in terms of the culinary and gastronomic cuisine in terms of say uh, the Barilla, a double pyramid and also the different um, uh, feasible diets related to culture. But we need more of this. And to me, the big question that we need to think about is what recipes are out there that meet or are actually within Eat Lancet dietary guidelines? And what are these recipes and how can we start shifting people to eating them? So, as I said, this is part of a long going um, work on natural language processing and recipe. So um, earlier in the year, we published in Frontiers of Artificial Intelligence, a lot of co-authors and I all working in this area. I've been working in terms of generic meals or um, representative recipes for quite a while, saying what makes a recipe statistically different from another recipe? So can you have one recipe for roast beef, another for spaghetti bolognese? When do they become each other? Bit complex, happy to talk about that later. I'd also highlight that we have a a poster in the poster session, um, which is some work funded by the Alpro Foundation, which is using natural language processing to look at four different online recipe da databases. And we've got the data there for greenhouse gas, water, land use, etc. per each of those recipes in four different cultures worth of database. But again, on the poster, we are only doing greenhouse gas emissions. And with this presentation today, there's a lot more complexity there, but we only have 10, well, seven minutes left. So I need to crack on. But there's multiple studies looking at nutrition of recipes, but this is still a very young field of investigation. I'll just highlight four particular papers if you've not heard about natural language processing and recipes before, but there's been examinations of how recipes have changed in terms of what's being submitted to the internet, how flavors link together, and also the popularity of sharing dishes online via social media, and if it's retweeted a lot, depending on the protein type. There's an amazing paper that's just coming out now from Cheng et al. So, also to add to this uh, difficult, well, complexity, eco-labels are becoming mainstream and eco-labels can definitely fill part of this gap in terms of recipes, because I think a lot of people, it's just started to happen here with My Emissions, a com online company, are producing eco-labels for different recipes. And they um, have put down a 28% of a fair day emission, um, which is around three kilos of greenhouse gas emissions per day from your recipes. Um, so there's lots of different eco-labeling there. We've implemented one in this paper here. So what we've done in this is partner with Edamam, a nutrition divider and semantic solution business um, that um, uses their nutrition software 
and analyzes different recipes and provides nutrition software back. Um, they've got a corpus of 5 million recipes in the English language, and they've um, we've provided to them, the City University of London, um, we've matched to them uh, the uh, 2,800 or so ingredients uh, linked to the USDA nutrition database um, linked to Poran Nemechek's paper. Um, and so we disaggregated Poran Nemechek up to this 2,800 data option. And then they've ranked all of these different food items, um, th these different recipes in terms of their carbon footprint per 100 grams, best to worst. So A plus being best, G being worst, and then uh, looking through that. They also have a database called Generic Meals, and that's what I'll be talking about mainly today. And the Generic Meals database is um, 180,000 recipes that encompass 90% or thereabouts of what recipes or restaurants currently offer, or would be commonly cooked at home in an English-speaking country, because this is, again, based on the semantic web of uh, English-speaking countries. And this means that similar recipes are clustered based on title within the 5 million, and then um, after removing non-essential non words, they create a generic meal set, and then the nutritional and ingredients are formulated into these generic meals that are those uh, 1,800, uh, 180,000 most common. They've then matched, Edaman have matched our CO2 data on top of that to generate both CO2 information as well as carbon labels for these generic meal sets, which to me is very exciting because it means any nutrition, any restaurant globally could therefore have a carbon label ready to go on any product globally now in the English language, which to me is very exciting. Today, because of this is a commercial uh, group, I'll be presenting the information in terms of per portion rather than per hundred grams, so people can't reverse engineer. But still, even from looking at things in terms of portion and recipe, we have a lot of information there. So the big result here is thinking about Eat Lancet compatible recipes. So from the 100, uh, 190, 180,000 recipes there that were 100% matches to CO2 data, um, there was a proportion of these 5,619 that met the criteria of if you scaled that recipe to 2,500 kilocalories and also 56 grams of protein, would both of those, if you tried for both of those, would it fit below the Eat Lancet criteria in terms of greenhouse gases um, if you were uh, going for that? And the answer is yes, there are recipes within the generic meal set that actually are sustainable and fit within that. So you, there are 5,619 recipes. Oh dear, the movement lights come off, apologies. There we go, trying to live greenly. Um, uh, uh, that would fit within this uh, data set, which to me is very, very exciting. Likewise, on average, the average mean greenhouse gas emissions is around two kilos of greenhouse gas per portion per day. But you can see there's a very long tail there. You can also see here in terms of Eat Lancet compatible, it's not just A plus and A recipes. There are other recipes flagged within the database which have lower carbon footprint labels, but are still within the Eat Lancet overall because of the using both energy and protein um, uh, barriers there. So I did a, a very easy linear optimization. Um, not, not really anything at all. But let's go on in the last five minutes or so to looking at cutting the data, because there's lots of ways we can cut these, uh, you know, 200, nearly 200,000 different recipes. So the first one of these is you could cut by health or diet type. So considering dieting recipes or ways of dieting, be, be it, you know, keto friendly, vegan, gluten free recipes, etc. Um, there's also this very big bar here, which is recipes that didn't have a health or dietary tag associated with them. Um, you can also see below the different count of the number of recipes. And to me, there is a spread of, of carbon footprints across these and the number of recipes also matters here. And the big finding is that within all of these, there are recipes that meet the Eat Lancet score. But also the very big finding and the exciting thing for me is the DASH diet is similar in comparison to mean standard deviation, et cetera, to the vegan in a vegetarian diets, which again, you know, thinking back to Pablo Monsalves' 2015 paper around looking at DASH with the EPIC cohort, it's really interesting to start thinking about what can we do and communicate around DASH sustainable recipes. 
The next one there in terms of cuisine type, so cutting by the um, origin of those different cuisines. Again, the, the number of recipes varies within this. Um, you can see there's much, many more um, American that goes off the chart, um, but across there, there are some, and in orange at the bottom, you can see that there are across multiple different recipe cuisine types, recipes that are actually sustainable and meet the Eat Lancet dietary guidelines. I'll then cut by dish type. And this gets a little bit mucky because of the number of different dishes out there, especially brunch. There were two tagged as brunch within the 200,000 or thereabouts, which means that there's a, a massive um, box plot there. But within this, if we look over this side, there are a number of recipes very small amounts within each of these different sorts of dish type even that meet the Eat Lancet guidelines. And that to me is very exciting. The most interesting thing here is this spike here, 24% of cereal tagged recipes are within Eat Lancet boundaries. Some others are within six or 8%. So again, this is showing to people, and if we delve deeper, what sort of recipes there are that can actually be feasible, can be sustainable, and we do have numbers. Finally, let's do a cut, one of the classic cuts that you could do as it were, excuse the pun, around ingredients. And you can see in terms of selecting the main protein type there, you can again see there are wide spreads. So within beef recipes, within lamb recipes, there are recipes that have low carbon footprints. However, the bad news is that there were none that were found within the generic meal set that were within the Eat Lancet guidelines. But within the rest of the different uh, foods, there are recipes that are healthy, sustainable, and meet those Eat Lancet guidelines. Interesting, just to highlight also that within cheese, there are variabilities within shrimp. All of these actually show for the first time, as it were, you know, the range of different complexities around per portion greenhouse gas emissions. That to me is amazingly exciting. So in my last minute there, I'll also just highlight that within ingredients, there are these different carbon label spreads across these different um, recipes based on the uh, emissions within them. So that means, you know, there are spreads there. But the key takeaways for me are, we now have a database of nearly 200,000 commonly cooked recipes in the English language, um, which you know, we can delve into deeper. And these, uh, the information is provided per portion, per kilocalorie, and per gram of protein, as well as a carbon label. So lots of different ways we could, in effect, slice the data and start comparing different recipes on. All of this information could be very easily available to consumers. And this API could easily be used. It's there to be used on menus, cookbooks, et cetera. And these recipe, and the good news for me is that there are recipes currently eaten out there in the English language that can be cooked um, and meet the Eat Lancet. So people are currently cooking foods. Some other people won't be though. The big other news is that we should start thinking about Dash vegan and vegetarian recipes as having these lowest footprints. Dash, of course, does contain meat, but in much smaller amounts. And finally, we need to think about how carbon and eco labels convey this complexity that I've just showed to you for the last 10 minutes when compared to specific dietary requirements. Remember that the carbon label of G to A plus, some of those with not only in the A plus, not only in the A, but in the Bs and the Cs were within Eat Lancet uh, label um, standards. So there's a lot of complexity there. And how do we start communicating that to consumers? So there we go. I've managed to fit it hopefully, and I'll look forward to taking your questions. Please do get in touch. Thank you so much to all my numerous collaborators in Edamam. Um, please do get in touch. This is an ongoing area of research. And if anybody's interested, we are doing a, a small workshop on Friday with some uh, people. So if you're interested in talking about where you see the future of this, do get in touch and we'll go from there. But thank you. Great. Thank you, Christian. Uh, very interesting. Lots going on there. And uh very much to uh, the discussion we've had earlier in the day in the idea of how do we turn research into action that you've got very much an actionable um, initiative going on here. I'm just curious, you said that restaurants now could have easy access to creating equal scores for their meals. How would it actually work if I have a restaurant now? Am I looking for kind of like for like within your database or am I uploading the actual ingredients? So, so you would have you would have two choices. Either um, we could just look at like for like in terms of database and that gives you a proxy. You could also approach Edamam as a company as well as there's multiple other companies out there such as MyMissions.Green, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who offer these sorts of services. So there's multiple people on the market, but for a starters, we have 200,000 recipes there which you could start looking at like for like. So all of the, you know, we could could easily start doing some scoring and ranking based on that so they can at least see what the shape of their menu is looking like. Okay. We also have with say with our um, NLP um, 
um, Alpro fun funding, we have a tool, online web tool. You can paste in the URL and it drops the recipes carbon footprint there right now. So you'll notice on my Twitter, I'm going, I'm cooking tonight this, it has this greenhouse gas emissions. I've been doing that for the last couple of months because just trying to get into the habit of that. But we can do that for greenhouse gas, land use, water use, et cetera. So we have these tools in a readily available format. Sorry, I'll, I'll keep going for questions. No problem, yeah. So we have from uh, Kerry Smith. So uh, aside from following the set of recipes, how do you think the complexity of sustainable diet choices could be communicated to consumers? That's a really good question, Kerry, and I don't have time to uh, do that uh, in uh, five to 10 minutes, but happy to continue talking about that with you. I think in terms of we can go to a carbon label, but it, I think, you know, going back to Tim Lang's concept of omni label, we need to think about how that fits in in terms of the multiple complexities, the locality um, and our work looking at, you know, balancing four different items rather than just one. It just creates cascading complexities there. So it is a very complex thing. But again, if we can simplify it to these recipes fit, eat Lancet or fit these multiple areas, that's a really exciting thing. Um, yeah, please do message me on Hoover or um, tweet me at, at Sartorial Foodie if you want to continue this conversation. Uh, another question here, um, you know, you used the uh, poor Nemechek database. Mm -hmm. Wave your arms there, there we go. So in the poor Nemechek database, so there's a lot of um, uncertainty that is in that database. So is that uncertainty reflected in your recipe data, Pete Scarborough? Asked. Yes, it, yes, it is. So this is the really exciting thing for me is we can use the poor Nemechek and I, and I chose to use it because of that uncertainty, because it provides the confidence intervals. Because in our online web tool, so in this database, in our presentation today, we only use the mean values. But in the online web tool, we have the 95 and 5% confidence intervals, which means we can actually produce recipes within 95 and 5% and confidence intervals because that's part of the beauty of the poor and Nemechek. And additionally, we are comparing the poor and Nemechek to other databases disaggregated to this. So you can get multiple um, understandings of this, as was said in the first discussion. It's a bit of a wild west at the moment, but the more data at that level and the more funding provided to this, the, the better this is going to get. But this is a first step in that, this direction and we're showing it's physically possible. And also having those 95 and 5% confidence intervals when comparing two recipes, it becomes a much more familiar thing to say, this one is, you know, throughout the food system, this is the mean thing, uh, but this recipe here, it's just that little bit different. And that's the, the sort of information we also need to be providing to consumers, that complexity provided by the five and 95% confidence intervals. Uh, I think we have time for one more here. So from uh, Emma Harvey Lawrence, do you think focusing on calories and protein only is potentially limiting for healthy recommendations that support the totality of a healthy diet? Very much so. Again, we were only able to do so much within a 10 minute presentation. Um, and again, you know, we have the USDA database there, which is matched to. So we could be doing lots of other um, items. But again, um, so this could show micronutrients per recipe. That, that's very easy. And multiple other of the studies I've put on my first two slides were already looking at that. So that's not a novel problem, as it were, looking at nutrient recommendations and how to recommend recipes in an online tool based on micronutrients. That's all been done for it's just bringing in the sustainability thing is the new thing so we now have the functionality and power to do those things and there's a big community of people who would hopefully be able to engage in that great excellent uh, i think a couple of more questions will come in but um as please message are, me on hoover i'll yeah. happily respond great thanks thank you very much christian we'll move on to our uh, third talk now so we have uh, emma garnett so dr emma garnett is the Prince of Wales Junior Fellow, Research Fellow at Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. So Emma is going to look at a different perspective altogether, looking at the role of pricing incentives and disincentives around meat and meat-free options. So Emma, go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm just trying to swap um, my display settings. So I, right, now you can still see a presenter view. Uh, Oh, no, all good. Excellent. I've got a friend sitting next to me who's able to, <laughs> to show. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's Emma Garnett. And uh, ooh, apologies. Oh, dear Zoom. Uh, I'm a researcher. Today I'm going to be talking about one of the chapters from my PhD, which was funded by Merck. So does a small alteration to the price of meat and vegetarian options affect their sales? So firstly, I don't think this is a surprise to any of us, the UK diet is not very sustainable. So the planetary health diet, a healthy diet devised to feed the world population within planetary boundaries, recommends you know, mostly plant-based with small amounts of meat, fish and dairy. 
And you can see in this graphic on the right hand side, we're eating in the UK about 680% of the recommended red meat intake. That's beef, lamb and pork. We're eating a lot more tubers, so that's sort of potatoes and starchy vegetables, more eggs, chicken um, and dairy. And really starkly, we're only eating about 18% of the recommended nuts and leggings intake. And so this graph and many others is on Kerry Smith's poster. So do go and check that out and talk to her about uh, her research. And how can we change diets uh, to be more sustainable? So in a recent uh, paper I'm a co-author on, on climate change and achieving next zero, we classified a population level intervention. So not considering um, information and education, but population level for diet change into two categories, the physical environment and the economic environment. So for the physical environment, you can think about altering at the micro level, so stores, cafeterias, restaurants, but also thinking at the macro level, villages, towns, cities, you know, how we shape our society. And essentially that boils down to decreasing the opportunities to consume unsustainable foods and increasing the opportunities to consume more healthy and sustainable foods. And then in parallel, we have the economic environment. So we can think about changing the prices of foods through subsidies, taxes, or other material incentives. And again, that essentially boils down to making the sustainable food option the most affordable and the less sustainable food options um, the least affordable. Zoning in onto one particular microenvironment, so my PhD research question was, how could university cafeterias increase vegetarian sales? And the experiments I tested did fit into that framework of changing either the physical or economic environments. Uh, so in terms of research I did on the physical environments, uh, Rachel's uh, discussed one of these papers already, um, looking at increasing the proportion and changing the position of, position of vegetarian options. And so if you're interested uh, to see what that did to vegetarian sales, do check out our papers in PNES and Nature Food. But what I'll be mostly talking about today is looking at economic environment changes, so changing a small change in price. And here is this price experiment design. So this took place in one Cambridge College cafeteria back in autumn term 2018 in the before times. And halfway through the term, we increased the meat options price by 20p from £2.52 to £2.72. And we decreased the vegetarian option price by 20p from £2.05 to 185 And the fish and vegan meal prices were unchanged at £2.85 and £2.39 respectively. So this was a small change and it was a sort of a one-off just once halfway through term. And that did mean it was much more feasible for the cafeteria to implement. Though if it had been a, an online or lab experiment, we might have tried uh, more extreme changes, but we had to do something the cafeteria felt confident and comfortable implementing. And this image you can see here is one of five electronic slides that rotated around outside the dining hall. And in quite small font at the bottom, uh, the text says, as of Monday, the 29th of October, the meal prices are changing a small amount to reflect the cost of ingredients. And we found out from the catering managers, uh, the vegetarian ingredients cost approximately £1.05 and the meat ingredients cost approximately £1.90. And this is one of the reasons we chose that 20p increase and 20p decrease, as during the intervention half after that change, both the meat and vegetarian option then had an 80p difference between the cost of ingredients and the customer price, instead of vegetarians essentially paying more out of pocket relative to the ingredients cost. Another very important detail, so we were able to track purchases from specific individuals as the catering managers kindly shared that data. So student diners generally pay for meals with their university cards and 90% of meal purchases we could link to individuals. So not 100%, but 90%. And we used data from a previous term to divide diners into quartiles based on how often they chose vegetarian meals, which made our statistics a lot more powerful. See so the bottom there, we've got sort of most, the most vegetarian quartile of diners in dark blue, through to sort of more veg, less veg, and then least veg in red, kind of the most uh, committed to meat diners. And here are some of the results we've got from 106 meal times, uh, 5,330 meals, and 325 known diners. And this is published in the Journal of Environmental Psychology, and I can put a link to a free version in the chat afterwards. And what we found was looking at the kind of overall aggregate sales, we did see um, a small increase in overall vegetarian sales, about 3.2 percentage points. 
but no significant change to overall meat sales. And actually fish and vegan sales at the aggregate level did decrease a little bit. And we also found this was driven, that, that increase in vegetarian sales was driven exclusively by that most vegetarian quartile. So as you can see here in this graph, so on the y-axis, we've got likelihood of selecting vegetarian meal. That goes from 0% to 70%. And as you can see in that most vegetarian quartile in dark blue, we're more likely to pick a vegetarian meal by 13.7 percentage points after that price change, when the veg was cheaper and the meat was a bit more expensive. Whereas that other three quarters of diners, um, pale blue, yellow, red, there we found no significant change. That small shift in price wasn't enough to get them to change their selections. And so to conclude, as uh, seven minutes is a wonderfully uh, short amount of time, we found that small change in price only significantly affected the most vegetarian quartile of diners. That led to a 13.7 percentage point increase in vegetarian sales. And this small price change uh, was, uh, had a much smaller effect than increasing the proportion of vegetarian options. You can see that from Rachel's work, you can see that from um, uh, in the PNAS paper as well. And so we really need uh, further research on price. Uh, this is a really important topic, kind of testing out different levels. So if this is something you're interested in, please do get in touch with me. Another really key important point. Um, caterers are really key sustainable food policy makers because they sit between individual level and system level change. They set the parameters um, for thousands of diners. And we discussed this in our currently impressed in nature human behavior, which I will tweet and share when that is online. And a very kind of brief final one, I need to talk to Christian, <laughs> uh, in terms of the research fellowships and work I'm doing at the moment, looking at the environmental footprint of supermarket products, uh, working with food steps and also Sainsbury's. And here's a very, very, very preliminary result looking at land use per quarter pounder for a beef burger and a lentil veg burger. So again, if this is something that you're interested in and finding more about or potentially collaborating, um, yeah, do get in touch, emma.garnet at CISL. Dot cam dot ac dot uk. And of course, huge thanks to my PhD supervisors and the catering managers and kitchen staff who uh, carried out all of these experiments. And thank you very much for listening. And I'll be very happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you, Emma. Uh, we often hear about uh, pricing as being kind of the obvious strategy, the most powerful motivator, perhaps, but it's always a difficult one to convince sometimes colleges and canteens or retailers and others to implement. Uh, I'd be the first question actually, when you when you approached the canteen of the cafeteria, um, was there any hesitation on their part? Um, did you have to negotiate that 20p? How did that process go? It's a really question. So I think, you know, firstly, I'm incredibly grateful to all of the catering managers who carried out the huge numbers of experiments. And I think they were, you know, quite open to it, but it was obviously kind of, you know, um, a two-way process and discussion. And I think we were very cautious and you know, we did not want negative consequences for them. We didn't want kind of a backlash from students to put them in an awkward position. And so the 20p up and 20p down, we thought was um, sort of fair and sensible for not only matching it to the ingredients cost better, but also if you had a student buying a meat option every single day, they uh, you know, they would be one pound 40 out of out of pocket kind of later on. And so even though 20p was quite a small amount in in real terms in some ways, but actually as a proportion of the meal price that uh, wasn't insignificant because university halls are subsidized in some ways or are, are operating under different constraints to a run of the mill business. Um, but yeah, no, it was a, an interesting process. And again, they didn't have any backlash, but we did see the small change. So um, I think we hit um, a good spot for, as a first experiment. Uh, we've got a question here from Ella asking about the, I guess about the baseline sales, the first half of the term before the price change. And what do you think could have been some of the confounding factors that affected the students' meal choices? Oh, and so what was the first part? The baseline, was that total yeah. number of meals? The baseline for the first half of the term before the price change. Yeah, so do, I'm just going to go grab this uh, ResearchGate paper uh, for anyone who doesn't have access to uh, the Journal of Environmental Psychology. So one of the challenges was, so that, hopefully everyone can see that link in the chat. Uh, because it was a one-off change, then time is a massive confounding variable. And so we found like total meal sales were sort of declining during the first half of term before we sort of made this intervention. Um, and it was simply, 
uh, whereas other experiments I've done on position and proportion of vegetarian options, we swap that week on week off. But we thought with price, that would just be um, inappropriate, kind of too confusing and kind of not what we were um, in some ways less useful. Uh, but this did mean that we had a, uh, the confounders were quite challenging and you know, time and um, we can control for that. So yeah, further, further research needed for sure. And a question kind of related to that, Paul Appleby mentions here around the vegan meal. So you changed the price of the vegetarian and the meat ones, but there was a vegan meal there and the price didn't change it. What do you think about, was that an issue do you think looking back? Um, not an issue insofar as because the vegetarian and vegan meals had different prices to begin with anyway. Had we changed the vegan meal price as well, it would become even more challenging to work out what would have gone on that would be kind of, I don't know, it's a three meal problem, four meal problem. Um, and what we did find for that most vegetarian quartile that if we, when we combined the vegetarian and vegan meal sales together, which again, you can read in the paper, um, we still saw like a big uptick in that most vegetarian quartile of about, uh, I think 12.7 percentage points. So perhaps there was the odd vegan meal getting selected less, but overall there was still this shift in that quartile. But yes, this cafeteria, um, because there were four different meal options with different prices, uh, quite a lot of moving parts. I think this is the joy and the challenge of working in real world conditions, that mm -hmm. things are messier, but you can see what, what would happen in the real world, which I think is what we're all interested in. Um, so that's it. When I'm getting R squared of about 30%, my partner laughs because he's a material scientist in a lab. He's like, only 30%? When I do experiments, if I've got an R squared less than 90, something's gone terribly wrong. And I was like, yes, you're not working with people. People are quite hard to predict. Um, one here from Rachel um, about, um, do you think you might have seen more of an effect in a different context where the meals, uh, where the meal prices weren't already quite low? Really good question. And yeah, so, you know, a 10% change, which is of what we approximately had a kind of 10% lower, 10% higher price change, which was still only 20p. So if you had a 10% price change on more expensive meals, um, maybe that would have shifted things. Uh, as you made the point, Rachel, you know, university students, you know, at Cambridge or Oxford is already not particularly representative of the UK um, in general. Um, I wonder, so I think students, and again, we talk about this in the discussion, um, are quite interesting because, you know, are not kind of asset rich and some students have, um, you, know, you know, very real kind of financial constraints, but because of the student loan system in the UK, uh, perhaps they have a bit more kind of financial freedom than some people with a young family on kind of low income jobs. So I think um, there were a number of reasons we thought that students might have been extra sensitive to this price change or less sensitive. And also you're not handing over cash, you're kind of paying on a university card. So there was lots of one way or the other it could have gone. But yeah, as more research in other contexts definitely needed and yeah, do get in touch. Great, very interesting and very curious to find out about uh, future trials on this, on this area of pricing. So thank you very much, Emma. We need to wrap up now. Uh, so yeah, thank you to our presenters, Rachel, Christian, and Emma. Um, you can now go, well, we have a bit of a break now. So the next session will start at 35 minutes past the hour. So you can head back to uh, Whova and check out the agenda for that next one. But uh, please also do go to the exhibitor area on Whova and you can check out all of the great posters here as well. So thanks again to everyone and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.